Welcome to uh, CMPS and GSP. I am uh, Bill Hurst. I'm the director of the Extension Division. And uh, tonight, I'm very happy to welcome uh, Jean um, Michel Rabate. And I want to also thank uh, Tracy Morgan for arranging to have him come. Um, very delighted to have him. I'm sure some of you know his work or have read some of his work. Uh, the, the CV is so extensive, I'm not going to even look at it. I'm going to go by my, my, my mind. Um, his contributions to literary, to literature, to literary theory, philosophy, I'm sorry, psychoanalysis, and uh, literary interpretation is uh, is really very profound. Um, he asked me to mention a couple of books that are uh, coming out in the spring, uh, this spring. The Pathos of Destiny. And, I'm sorry, The Pathos Distance. of Distance. My mind is not working well. I just head there. <laughs> the Pathos of, of, uh, That's book. of Distance. <laughs> I'm writing The Pathos of Destiny, <laughs> which is likely to say this. And the other, uh, the other is Think Big, uh, which is the limits of the human idea about uh, Simon Becker. Right. So, um, without any further comment, I, here is uh, Jean Michel Rabaté. Thank you for suggesting the title of the next book. Uh, <laughs> uh, and it's a pleasure and an honor to be talking to you tonight. And I will uh, not simply present this book that some of you may have seen, but I will somehow use some of the materials of this introduction, Cambridge introduction Can you to speak literature. Up? We don't hear you. You don't hear? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Better? Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Often these microphones can be very, very touchy. So, uh, this introduction to literature and psychoanalysis has a funny little history behind it, and I barely dare to show you the cover, uh, because when I finished the book, I asked a friend of mine, Anne de Gell, who is a French artist, who had a beautiful series at the Freud Museum, uh, just after I had come with a Mexican artist, and we just barely overlapped, and she did a series with you can recognize here Freud's uh, couch. Um, but after we had accepted this as a, with the press editor, uh, when it came to showing the book on Amazon, Amazon US objected frontal nudity. And so I asked the artist whether she could find another, explain, you know, America, so she found another picture, but it was not as good. And I really owe this to Ray Ryan, an Irish man, who said, I don't mind, really impose it. And he was right. Finally, Amazon accepted that cover. And this is now what you can, you can uh, see. Anyway, this is a way of saying that uh, as soon as you talk about psychoanalysis and literature, people expect weird things, and um, I uh, will begin by mentioning something I discovered relatively recently, uh, which is that uh, we, we know that Freud didn't really like American culture. He had many negative comments uh, about it. But it's something that you know could be for the next book, Battles of Destiny. Uh, <laughs> uh, this uh, what I discovered recently is a strange author called Vierek, who had met Freud and <coughs> interviewed Freud in 1927. And so uh, I'll begin with this because it shows that Freud, even though he was extremely critical of American culture as such, and maybe he remembered what he had seen in 1909, when he came to the US, was asking this German-American author, 
Vierek to write a book on psychoanalysis. Why? Because Vierek had written a very interesting book on Steinach. And it was a time, as you may remember, that Freud had undergone the Steinach operation himself. And this is how, uh, so Vierek was known as a novelist, as a poet, and also, perhaps more notoriously, as a, a let's say, Nazi. And he became one of the first and only uh, American Germans to be jailed during the Second World War because he had endorsed Hitler. But before, in 1927, he interviewed Freud. And this is what Freud said. He basically, Eric said that Freud's ideas about sexuality were perhaps a little too raw, too difficult to be accepted in America. Then Freud says, well, if you are just, uh, if you know your own tradition, I, I, I quote this, uh, I reply with the words of your own poet, Walt Whitman. And so Freud quotes Whitman in English, yet all were lacking if sex were lacking. <laughs> and so it showed that Freud had read that poem by Whitman. And Freud then adds immediately to Vierek, I, I have already explained to you that I place today almost equal emphasis upon that which lies beyond pleasure, death, negation of life. And so this is an interesting moment in 1927 when you see Freud trying to convince somebody he calls an American, even though he was German-American, but his work, as his literary work, is in English, um, to convince him that Whitman, after all, was the poet of sexuality, but he is trying to talk about the beyond the pleasure principle and the idea of the death drive. Uh, this is, of course, connected with what was interesting him at the time, as you may know, the reasons for the Steiner operation. Do you know what the Steiner operation is? You know? okay. It was simply the ligature of the prostate. Steiner, who was the main, you might say, invent discoverer of the hormones uh, at uh, marriage. He was the first to have uh, masculinized or feminized little guinea pigs. And then he did this to a number of people, including Freud. In Freud's case, it was, we know, because he was hoping, and that was one of the things that Tyna was promising, that this would cure his cancer. As some of you may know, there's a, another poet well-known poet, Yates, William Butler Waits, Yates, who had also a tie up operation in 1936. And he said that it had uh, been very effective and had given him back his sexual drive, as it were. In Freud's case, uh, he was simply said that he didn't hurt him, but he didn't bring any improvement in his health. But nevertheless, uh, he liked Vierek because of Vierek's connection with Timer, and somehow he was planning that Vierek could write a little book on psychoanalysis in English, like he had done with Timer. And uh, if one reads the uh, long discussion, uh, we can see indeed that Vierek is a little of uh, an anti Semite. This is what he, he, he writes about Freud. Uh, he says uh, that uh, uh, Freud would consider himself German indeed, but above all, a Jew. And this is what Freud said, given what has happened recently in 1927, I consider myself no longer a German. I prefer to call myself a Jew. And Derek, in his interview, writes, I was disappointed by this remark. It seemed to me that Freud's spirit should dwell on heights beyond any prejudice of race, that he should be untouched by any personal rancor, yet his very indignation, his honest wrath, made him more endearingly human. Achilles would be intolerable, 
if it were not for his heel. <laughs> so Freud's heel would be his endorsement of his Jewishness, which is quite uh, ironical in the context. Um, what we can see here, and, and uh, in the discussion with Derek, is in a very interesting book. You must have it in your library, I, I'm, I'm sure, because I said that you had a great library. It called Psychoanalysis and the Future, edited by Benjamin Nelson, 1957. It's very interesting to see how people envisage the future of psychoanalysis in 1957, uh, really uh, far from what we have seen uh, really happen. But um, in the long interview, and Vienna was a good interviewer, interviewed just after Freud, he went to Germany, and interviewed Hitler and uh, a few other dignitaries of the Nazi party. But uh, Bierk liked Shaw. Shaw was at that time a very important writer. And it's interesting to see that Freud loves Whitman, he keeps on quoting Whitman, and hates Shaw. <laughs> and, and so uh, when uh, he, he quotes this long poem that you may know by, by Whitman, uh, in which you have, we might say, uh, one of the most scandalous poems of Whitman. Uh, Whitman imagines that he is going to have sex with all men and women, basically, and we have children with both uh, sexes and so on. Uh, poem of procreation uh, was almost uh, censored. Uh, whereas Shaw, uh, who is presented by Vierek as a more palatable modernist writer, as uh, Freud says, Shaw doesn't en understand anything about sexuality. Okay. Uh, and he adds uh, the, uh, that uh, he doesn't understand sex and he doesn't understand psychology either. But we can see at that time, in 1927, of course, uh, Freud died. Uh, a little more than a decade later, that Freud was uh, both insisting that there was an American tradition of poetic discourse that had to do with sexuality, and perhaps it was in literature that it was best exemplified, and at the same time, he's insisting, theoretically speaking, on what we would call the death drive. Okay. Since as you may know, and this is something that I try to discuss in a book called Crimes of the Future, um, the Beyond the Pleasure Principle, um, I, I saw this recently, and maybe it's also in your library, I don't know whether there was a very good Spanish edition of the manuscript showing how Freud worked on it in three moments and added a number of remarks on the fact that perhaps, as he says to Derek, we die because we want to die. Mm -hmm. And in Beyond the Pleasure Principle, there is this very strange moment when Freud seems to say, well, the repetition principle and uh, entropy seem to suggest that life is going to exhaust itself. But no, there is the possibility and this is the seventh and last chapter, that some animals at least could reproduce themselves forever, and perhaps there would be something in the humans that would be similar. <clears throat> what we can say is that if we look at the reception of Freud in the US after 1927, on the side of sexuality, it seems that many of his ideas were more or less accepted, at least if we think of, say, Hollywood, uh, Hitchcock, and so on. The issue was not so much with sexuality. It was much more, of course, with the question, the contested question of the death drive. And this is where, here, I just make that uh, remark, because and this you will see how leads me back to the book on literature and psychoanalysis. Because fundamentally, what I would try to argue, and this is uh, an analysis that one could do maybe without Freud, but I think goes better with Freud, one could uh, uh, try to tackle this by uh, someone like Derrida. What he's writing, after all, if it is not on the side of death, 
and perhaps traversing a certain death. This is how I try to pitch it in, in that book. But in this uh, sort of scandal uh, that uh, for the later Freud, there was sort of dualism, there was uh, the uh, Eros and Thanatos somehow. This was what most American psychoanalysts refused to accept then. And here I was interested to see that two thinkers who were important for me, Adorno and Lacan, both insist on the primacy, you might say, of the death drive. Um, you may know this uh, essay by Adorno, Die Revidierte Psychoanalyse, uh, that was based on lectures that Adorno uh, gave in America. Uh, you, you know that Adorno stayed in America from 1938 to 1949, and it was a lecture he gave in English, uh, so it's easy to find, uh, in 1946 in San Francisco, and where Adorno attacks contemporary American psychoanalysis, Eric Fromm, Karen Horney, and so on, for having distorted Freud completely. <coughs> it's very interesting. And I said, usually we don't see Adorno as being on the side of psychoanalysis, but clearly he understood Freud very, very well. <coughs> and uh, what he saw Adorno was that uh, the theory of the death drive had to be eliminated, and psychoanalysis had become the theory of social adaptation, uh, like Horny, as you may know. And the root of neurosis for her was social competition, fundamentally. And uh, so this, for Adorno, is a distortion. And of course, this is something with which Lacan would agree. We could return to this, but there are many passages, I will not quote them, uh, in Ecrit. Uh, in which Lacan mentions this idea that the death drive gives the formula for the drive as such. Uh, and uh, as you may know, Lacan also waged a certain war against the uh, Americanization of psychoanalysis or the idea that uh, psychoanalysis was just adaptive psychological meliorism and so on. <coughs> Of course, with Lacan, we enter a slightly different world, and it may be a little forbidding for American audiences, but I can tell you that even for French readers, Lacan is really difficult to read. So it's not just a matter of translation. And what I was trying to do when I wrote this Cambridge introduction was to avoid writing a Lacanian book. That was really my main aim. I had done in 2001 a little book on Lacan literature, and I didn't want them to be identical. At times they overlap a little bit, and I can return to a few of these analyses. But fundamentally, I wanted to cover a much broader spectrum having to do with psychoanalysis and literature. But uh, here, I would say simply in uh, general that if we take the question of psychoanalysis and literature from my professional angle, that is, I teach in an English department, psychoanalysis has a bad press. This is something we can know. <laughs> and that uh, it is indeed very, very rare that students could be accepted in a great program in literature with a psychoanalytic approach. Okay. Uh, and uh, this, I was, uh, when I uh, uh, wrote the introduction, I went back to one of the most vocal critics uh, of the application of psychoanalysis to literature, Nabokov. Okay. I don't know whether you remember, but Nabokov is absolutely ferocious and in a fire, which is sort of parody of it, criticism, uh, he makes fun of Erich Fromm, who had said that the uh, cap of red velvet, the little red riding hood, 
it was a symbol of menstruation that for Nabokov was really so absurd. <laughs> and there's a very good book by uh, Jeffrey Berman, Merci, called The Talking Cure, Literary Representation of Psychoanalysis, in which he goes back to that controversy and he observes that what Fromm is doing actually is not so absurd given the context. But indeed, what Nabokov is attacking, and I think this is what most of my colleagues would be attacking, is this sense that psychoanalysis offers allegorical interpretations of literature. And as Nabokov says, it's medieval. It's like finding, and of course, there was a time indeed in the 50s, there's also a very interesting book on Freudianism and the literary mind, when any steeple was a pharos, every well was a vagina, and so on. You see what I mean? This kind of symbolic uh, interpretation of our symbols. And uh, as uh, Nabokov uh, writes, and this is an interesting passage, I reject completely the vulgar, shabby, fundamentally medieval world of Freud, with its crankish quest for sexual symbols, something like searching for Baconian, Baconian acrostics in Shakespeare's works, and its bitter little embryos spying from their natural nooks upon the love life of their parents. Um, at the same time, if you know a little bit the work of Nabokov, uh, you know that he uh, achieved real celebrity in the United States with this book, Lolita. And Lolita <laughs> is clearly a book that has to do with psychoanalysis. But of course, in Lolita, uh, what we have is Nabokov's uh, slightly, uh, you say, uh, perverse play in which the therapist can be read as the rapist, uh, as, he, as, he, as he says. And, and uh, what interested me, and this is how I tried to introduce this in the, the introduction, Freud reading the Dora case and Nabokov reading his invention of Lolita have much more in common than one would imagine. And if you know other texts by Nabokov, like Ada, the last long novel, um, that is perhaps his masterpiece, I, I would say. Uh, Ada has to be pronounced as in Russian, not Ada, means hell. Uh, but uh, Ada is a story of incest, between brother, sister, incest. So you can say that in Nabokov's own work, there is nevertheless a very uh, loaded, uh, naughty tension with uh, these uh, Freudian issues. And of course, uh, if he can make fun of bad literary criticism. Uh, the point is not so much literary criticism as such, as the links between literature and psychoanalysis, fundamentally. And here, I uh, would just mention another book that unhappily hasn't been translated into English, but some of you may know the name of the author, because I think he came several times to New York, called Pierre Bayard, I don't know that you, uh, Pierre Bayard wrote this very uh, funny uh, little book called uh, How to Talk About Books You Haven't Read, <laughs> which is a very French thing, by the way. <laughs> but he, 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 uh, so that has been translated, and it's an excellent little book in which he shows how a number of French intellectuals, poets, and so on. And anybody in this room has, has read it? No? Okay, I, I really recommend it. First, it gives you. It gives you. It gives you very good tips. You know, I mean, of course, for uh, English professors, we do this all the time. We all the time pretend that we read, you know, uh, this or that with students who come and say, "Of course, you read this. Of course, of course." Uh, but it shows very well how a poet like Paul Valéry, for instance was able to write a, a eulogy for Marcel Proust, obviously without having read any line by Proust, <laughs> and managing to sound very intelligent <laughs> uh, with Proust. Anyway, 
He, uh, what interested me in the position of Pierre Bayard is that he is a psychoanalyst in Paris and he's also a professor of French literature, who has really an interesting work. But the book that um, I think should be translated, although I don't like it so much, I translate the title, is Can One Apply Literature to Psychoanalysis? In this book, and so the reason why I think it should be translated is this, that he shows very well, a little like Nabokov, but of course from within, that psychoanalytic literary criticism, he wouldn't say is medieval or is on the side of allegorism, but he says that it is religious. And he takes the example of, uh, let's say, religious interpretations of the Bible that basically always find what you look for given the concept and the method. So he has a long analysis of the many French and not so French uh, approaches to literature of the 70s, 80s, and so on. And he proves indeed quite well that most of them presuppose something like an unconscious of the text or the unconscious of the the author, and basically once you have found that unconscious, the key is given, and you don't really read literature. And so this is a, a true problem. What he suggests is something like reversing this idea of applying, applying uh, like applied psychoanalysis, and it is, for those of you who know a little bit Lacan, Lacan was always opposed to applied psychoanalysis, but of course he applied psychoanalysis all the time. Uh, and in the same way, uh, you can say that for uh, Pierre Bayard, applying literature to psychoanalysis means returning to what he sees as Freud's general position, that is that a psychoanalyst learns from a writer. And indeed, something that we see in Freud, and what Bayard adds is that, of course, what Freud adds is they found the truth, but they didn't know how they found it. You need me, Freud, to tell them what it was that they had found. Right? And of course, this is a paradox, but I don't think it is so bad at the same time. And here, I would say that uh, in, in Lacan, uh, there is a huge hesitation between certain readings of certain authors in which he tries to read, you might say, the signifier of the text, and others, one that I, I worked a lot on, James Joyce, uh, for Lacan, when he reads James Joyce, basically, you might say, it is a variation on the idea of the psychobiography. But we can ask, is psychobiography such a bad genre? I'm not so sure now. See, and we know, at least we, when I say we, I mean uh, professors of English literature, French literature, that the genre of the biography is still today the dominant mode of access to literature. You just go to any bookstore in New York and you'll see, you know, 10 books of literary criticism and 300 books of biography. Is it something that we should prohibit or not? Uh, it is obvious that people like me, when we start teaching, say, a new author, we read the biography. <laughs> we do. <laughs> what do we derive from the biography? Uh, it, it varies, I think, according to periods and, and the authors. But for instance, uh, it would be very difficult to discuss Virginia Woolf, without knowing that she committed suicide, for instance. See, the kind of very obvious fact about her life, or that Joyce had a psychotic daughter, and so on. Whatever you do with this. Right? Of course, it is often the case that these biographies are written by people who have begun liking the text, and then they find in the text the life of the author. Is that something that should be accepted or not? 
Wikipedia said, uh, I must have triggered something in your opinion. Yeah, yeah, sorry, biography. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so here, if you take, say, you know, important writers uh, like Proust and so on, it's obvious that you need to know something about their life just to know that what they write that looks like a biography is not a biography, in fact. And so that, that poses many, many problems. But we know indeed that in the history of the bright psychoanalysis, Freud believed that uh, his friend Marie Bonaparte, I don't know whether you read her really good book on Poe, uh, which has been translated but abridged in English, was the model of what he liked as literary criticism. And anybody here knows this, this book by Bonaparte? Huh? It's scary, <laughs> I would say. Basically, everything in Poe's life is determined by the fact that he had been adopted by this man, Alan, who he hated. He had lost his mother very young. And so all the feminine characters in his stories and poems who die of a mother, all the persecutory doubles uh, are Alan coming back. And it's a sort of Kleinian reading of a poem that is really heavy handy. At the same time, once in a while, she catches a few interesting things. But let's say that when she published this in the 1930s, Freud wrote a long preface and endorsed it fully. But clearly, this is not the Freud we use when we talk about literature. And uh, what I did in the book was to go back to a file that really interested me, and I guess some of you may uh, know this, which is the very, very young Freud in his correspondence with Eduard Zilberstein. I don't know whether you've taken a look at this. I recommend those letters, they are extraordinary. <clears throat> First of all, because we discover a very young Freud. Uh, and he had this, uh, it's the first of the many, you might say, male friendships with uh, correspondence with people who were somehow the alter ego. And uh, in uh, the letters of Freud invented, and it's something that is really important, he, with his friend Zilberstein, invented the Spanish Academy. And they wrote to each other in Spanish. The interesting thing is that they didn't really know Spanish. <laughs> but it has something to say about deciphering the unconscious. They both had liked uh, Cervantes, and it was one story that some of you may know, Coloquio de los Perros, which is the dialogue between the dogs. <coughs> and uh, so Scipio and Berganza, and they would exchange. And, uh, Freud was the more philosophical one, and they would, Freud's idea was that every week they would spend at least one or two hours writing about the events of the week, analyzing them, and send it to the other. And he was only 17. These letters are so interesting uh, because we can see a very witty Freud writing extremely well. Uh, as you know, the German of Freud is quite remarkable. But there you can see a character, let's say, in Jean Paul, uh, kind of romantic uh, poet. Uh, one of his models is also, you might say, Tristan Shandy, stern, it's very sternian, and full of what we call romantic irony. And at the same time, there is a project of, you might say, examined life. See? It has to be not only an exchange of letters, but letters written in the invented Spanish of Cervantes. Right? Um, in uh, the, uh, for instance, you see Freud at the same time in those letters talking about Feuerbach, philosopher. He was reading with passion, which is also interesting if you uh, 
what can be seen as Freud's political, um, the Feuerbach was a socialist, you might say, uh, position then. <clears throat> then, of course, Freud discovers Don Quixote and loves Don Quixote. And I think this is indeed a psychoanalytic novel, if one reads it well. Uh, it's something that Freud, uh, it was a little later in the correspondence, notes, if you know Don Quixote, and you will remember that you always have the knight who is, you might say, crazy, delusional, and uh, Sancho Pancha, who is realistic, who has his feet on the earth and so on. But, as Freud noted, at the end of the novel, if you remember the ending of the novel, it's quite a long novel, and the second half shows more Sancho being in control of the little island. And, but at the end, finally, Don Quixote realizes his delusion. And then he dies, or he is going to die out of pure, you might say, depression. And there's this very interesting moment at the end when Sancho tells him, no, 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 I believe you are really a knight. Let's go again for new adventures. But Kixiano, and his real name, uh, simply dies. So uh, it's indeed an interesting uh, commentary, you might say, on the interaction between delusion and reality and the need for a certain illusion. And we know that Freud returns to this when he talks about uh, the future of an illusion, when he talks about religion as uh, he, 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 in that book, uh, the difference between an illusion and a delusion it is so central. At least with uh, a point of departure that I took here in the correspondence, we can see a very gifted young Freud who has at his disposal a huge culture, uh, and we know that this culture included English, and Freud, we, we know, had read all of Shakespeare in English and had memorized a lot of Shakespeare. It was extremely, uh, uh, let's say, Britishophile, uh, and uh, this is why in many that has been observed by many commentators, um, he often quotes Shakespeare from memory, and he makes many mistakes, but small mistakes, because he uh, has uh, learned, uh, he, he read it and, and memorized it in the same way as he had uh, invented the Spanish. Um, it's something that some of you may have seen. I was surprised the first time I went, I mentioned earlier, the Freud Museum in London. If you go there, you see the library, Freud's library, and you will see that only one-tenth of the books have to do with psychoanalysis, psychology, medical issues, nine-tenths about literature, archaeology, Egyptology, uh, comparative mythology, and so on. So uh, Freud really believed in that. And in a sense, this is something that we see very well in his analysis of the, uh, what could be the culture of a psychoanalysis. If you remember, very important text for me, um, lay analysis. When Freud says that, after all, the psychoanalyst doesn't really need to know the names of all the bones and muscles and so on, but should know the names of the gods and mythology and religion and so on. And so uh, in that text, you see Freud talking about something that in German is Literaturwissenschaft, the science of literature. So Freud believes, I would say, that he is as far as the training of a psychoanalyst is concerned in something like literary criticism. What is exactly Literaturwissenschaft for Freud? It's not exactly what we call literary criticism, clearly. But Wissenschaft means science. So there is, there is this belief in Freud that a good psychoanalyst will not only be somebody who is well-read, but who has meditated, if I take literary criticism at its most basic, it means that you have a few definitions to talk, you know, what is prose, what is a genre, what is tragedy, and so on. And I think here, 
we enter into the domain of literature somehow. And when I, uh, uh, let's say, progressed from this point of view, one important dialogue that I used here was Freud's, uh, I would say, distortion by the avant-garde. And um, I was always interested in the way in which surrealism, for instance, a certain surrealism, had taken Freudian ideas to move into a radical poetics, you might say. And after all, we should not forget that, for those of you who read a little bit of Lacan, Lacan's point of departure was also a friendship with the Surrealists. But as you may know, the Surrealists very quickly were a little disappointed with Freud. And uh, so what interested me as well here, and it's not really something that I had done in, in that book, but uh, I, I tried to uh, mention it elsewhere, was the way in which Freud but a little later, he met first with André Breton, and there was a total misunderstanding. They couldn't understand each other. Uh, Breton, full of hopes, imagined that Freud was a sort of revolutionary, and he saw a very conservative, uh, MD, physician looking, uh, who had no interest in contemporary literature. Breton had the impression. Ten years later, Salvador Dali goes to Vienna and has an excellent contact with Freud, which is interesting because at that time, Salvador Dali had broken up with Breton and his previous friends, but I can say that maybe it is with the visual world that there was something that had taken place, and we know that Dali had seen in Freud an opening for what he called paranoia criticism. And some of the earlier works of Delhi are really full of references to psychoanalysis and mostly to Freud. And in that debate, there was also somebody who was quite important for me, Georges Bataille, who was also a Freudian of a different kind, but who, more than Breton, insisted on a certain materialism in psychoanalysis. As you may know, if you know the work, we can return to this, the work of Bataille. Uh, for Bataille, the danger was the Freudian dualism and what he saw in Breton as the lyricism of the avant-garde and as a sort of idealism. He saw that the central intuition of Freud was sexuality and base matter, as he would say. And so, this is indeed the moment when Freud was still alive, and obviously, as many critics have shown, and as the publication, the forthcoming publication, a very interesting new biography by Elisabeth Rudinesco uh, of Freud, um, in which she, she shows, uh, given that her point of view is more French, but she uh, uses Freud's patience mostly to talk about, about Freud uh, in, in, in his time. But clearly, what most, uh, and she doesn't, uh, she follows the same pattern, Freud's culture is mostly from the 19th century and before. But this is why I wanted to show that he was still interested in literature and more contemporary literature. Uh, or, or American literature, uh, like Whitman, and so on. But we can say that he, he didn't really understand the uh, question of the avant-garde, clearly. But and would not condone the use of the exploitation of, for instance, the theory of hysteria that the Surrealists were using uh, in 1928. Some of you may know this. Uh, the surrealist uh, published uh, uh, Praise of Hysteria, and for them, uh, it's been, uh, some of you may have seen a few recent films that touch on hysteria, like A Dangerous Method, or uh, the, there's a film called Augustine, French film, uh, talking about hysterics and Charcot and Freud, so there's 
return to that to that period, the theory for the surrealist hysteria was a poetic mode of expression, was not a disease. Lacan, as you may know, starts from there, and this is where I can say that even though I tried to write the non-Lacanian book, I am a Lacanian, because what we see in Lacan is the possibility of overcoming all those contradictions that are vaguely suggested so far between you know, knowing in advance what we want to find in the text and talking about clinical issues, talking about literature, the avant-garde, and so on. What you have in Lacan, and this is the central insight in the first essays that he publishes with a few other psychoanalysts and psychiatrists in the 30s, is that there is no distinction between the productions of psychotics who are in hospitals and the works of the poets like Breton, Eloi, and others who imitate their writings. And so it doesn't really matter for Lacan whether you can say that when uh, Breton and others pretend to be hysterics or paranoiacs or Dali pretends to be the paranoiac, you could say, oh, this is not serious. Huh? No. Why? Because for Lacan, what counts is the rhetoric, the poetical rhetoric that is deployed then. And if you can understand it, you can understand it via the reading of a poem, or you can understand it via the analysis of the patient's discourse. I insist on this because this is really, for me, taken in the context of a certain French journalism. Why? Because, as you may know, it's something that not so many people know, actually, even in French uh, literary circles. Uh, André Breton was a psychiatrist, psychiatrist early on. His first poem, the first poem that somehow launched his career, is a poem that he wrote after having heard a patient, he was in Saint-Dizier during the war, a patient, it's called sujet, subject. It's a patient who had been traumatized by the war and believed that what he saw was not real, that the war was just a show. It couldn't be true that so many people would die and so on, and it was a sort of stage just for him, and basically Breton just copied what this patient was saying and wrote sujet and so on. And so uh, Breton clearly knew when he, he published this that he had recreated it, but it was extremely close to just notes taken uh, during a session. And so of course Breton then launched surrealism, a movement that was somehow Freudian, but with certain distortions. This is something that I discuss in my chapter. Uh, this led to a controversy between Freud and Breton. What was it that they were trying to discuss? The main issue were dreams, the question of dreams and reality. As you may know, uh, in surrealism, following Freud, the idea was that dreams can tell us more about the reality of our desires, uh, of our true selves, and so on. <coughs> but Breton believed that dreams can also be prophetic. Okay. Uh, which is, I mean, you can think, why did he have this belief? Uh, he, he believed, in a sense, and you can understand why this is connected with this political commitment, that if there is no fundamental distinction between dreams, meaning what we understand, thanks to Freud and others, about what dreams tell us about ourselves and reality, then it should force us to change life as such. Whereas what he uh, contested was what you see really in Freud, this idea that you can only understand dreams by going back to 
the past, the childhood, trauma, memories, and so on. Freud always refused to imagine anything like a prophetic dream, clearly. Was Jung had a different opinion about this. And this is something that I tried to tackle in that book uh, briefly in passing somehow, but still, that I still think that uh, Jung is often a little maligned in uh, Freudian circles. Um, I never forget, for instance, the fact that Lacan, we know, uh, went to see Jung personally and not Freud, and that uh, the famous story that we have now everywhere, including even in the dangerous method, um, that Freud arriving to New York said, they don't know that we are bringing them the plague. I don't know whether you know this, but this is what Jung, who was there, told Lacan, who heard it, and then published it. So <coughs> could this be an invention of Jung or of Lacan? We don't know. But at least this is how we have that. It, it's such a good story that it had to be invented if it wasn't true. But <laughs> it's, this is the derivation. And here I am interested in the fact in which uh, it's something that I often think that obviously Freud would not have been able to read Ulysses. Jung, we know, didn't like Ulysses, but read it from beginning to end and wrote a very, very interesting introduction to Ulysses. And of course, we, we know that uh, Joyce himself went to see Jung several times when the psychic uh, deterioration of his daughter was obvious and was hoping that Jung would cure her. Jung, who I think on this point was extremely smart, decided that it was hopeless, uh, but just told, Freud, uh, told uh, sorry, Joyce, uh, of course, uh, we need to be aware that in German, Freud means joy, and Joyce is not very far. Uh, <laughs> but he, he told uh, Jane Joyce that Lucia Joyce was, after all, a creator as he was. And, of course, he added for himself uh, that where Joyce managed to uh, surface from the sea of the unconscious, she was drowning. Joyce decided to interpret this as meaning that she was not so psychotic, so crazy after all, and that she could go on as she was. And happily, we know that she uh, went down quite simply, which is a huge issue if we think of uh, the links between Joyce's last novel, Finnegan's Wake, and the language of psychosis. It could be said, it could be argued that Finnegan's Wake is Joyce's attempt at inventing a mad language similar to the mad language of Lucia Joyce. Right. But just to say about Jung, that Jung had this intelligence of modernity, you might say, that uh, some, um, one could say that Freud would have been too shocked by the experimental nature of a text like Ulysses, clearly. Uh, which doesn't mean that we cannot elaborate the literary criticism based on Freudian principles, but that uh, we have to re-examine them. And here, I would just mention two debates uh, in which I would use Lacan, I just mentioned this, in one chapter. One is the Hamlet, the case of Hamlet which is so important for uh, Freudian theory um, and the, uh, let's say, more generally Greek tragedy somehow. We can, of course, notice that most concepts in Freud have their origin in literary texts, right? That Oedipus is, after all, the character before being anything else in a play by Sophocles. How did Freud reach this understanding of the key position of the Oedipal drama that 
for some, like Deleuze, uh, take too much place, it is via his reading of Hamlet. And we know it went in that direction. Not first Sophocles, then Shakespeare, but first Shakespeare, then Sophocles. Basically, the main insight for Freud was to understand, as he thought he understood, that Hamlet's inhibition could be explained by the difference between the Greek hero who kills his father asleep with his mother and the Renaissance hero who cannot do it. So this is well known, of course. What interests me in Lacan's reading of this, this the finally the seminar uh, on desire and its interpretation has been oh, sorry. So it means that I have maybe spoken too long. Okay. Uh, I'll be I'll be brief. Sorry, am I am I a little too long? Just just uh, so two minutes to finish on this and then I hope. I you wish can. you would yeah. keep going for as long as you can. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you, thank you. I'll, I'll be I'll be as as as, as brief as I can here. Okay. What Lacan does when he uh, rereads the famous text by Freud and, and Jones, mostly, is to observe this. He said, oh, <coughs> Freud's theory is that Hamlet cannot kill his uncle because his uncle has realized his unconscious desire. But why? Why not say that precisely because his uncle is a successful rival, why wouldn't he want all the more to give a successful rival? So what Lacan adds is that what you have in Freud is an unexamined psychology of imitation. And this is where Lacan is interested because uh, uh, from his uh, linguistic and quasi-structuralist point of view, he tries to debunk or uh, somehow get rid of the old psychology. Why? Because he had worked on this about the mirror stage and the many cases he had treated. For instance, the famous case of Aimé, who was a young woman who thought that the Prince of Wales was in love with her and she tried to kill an actress who was supposed to be the lover of the Prince of Wales. So there was and so what, what you see with, with Lacan is a transformation of a number of statements made by Freud about literature and uh, showing that fundamentally for him, or Lacan, we could talk about that, uh, the key in Hamlet is not the desire of Hamlet for his mother, but the question of the mother's desire. That's the key. And basically, uh, Hamlet is lost or tries to understand why would his mother have fallen for the uncle and not remain with his own father, which leads to a slightly more tentative, I would say, statement that the second key in Hamlet for Lacan is Ophelia, the, the other feminine character. Why? You can guess it, of course. No, Ophelia is the phallus. <laughs> <laughs> we can return to that. But uh, there's a long demonstration that Ophelia, and you hear it in the signifier, contains something like the phallus for Lacan. That is the question of castration, somehow, which redoubles the question of the interrogation about the mother's desire. But as you can see in Lacan, the Lacan of the uh, seminar six and so on, there's a huge displacement from what he calls the Freudian myth of the Oedipus to a sort of more Kleinian position for Lacan. The big other is on the side of the mother. And we have to understand everything differently with that shift. There, I can say that I am Lacanian because indeed, I think it makes sense to understand Freud as a mythographer. He invents this myth of Oedipus that is used 
the sort of universal key, which is a little disappointing. But what he manages to create with this is quite amazing. See, and of course, if we go on with the uh, the root somehow, which is the Sophocrean uh, uh, nexus, uh, what for Lacan is perhaps more important than just the fact that, after all, Oedipus kills his father, sleeps with his mother, without knowing it, is whether Jocasta knew it. And it's quite likely that she did. Uh, and also, for Lacan, whether Antigone, as the daughter, uh, is not perpetuating the pathos of destiny. <laughs> <laughs> I knew I was going to face it. The pathos of destiny, which is the title of my book, I'm going to change the title. Okay. <laughs> Here it is. Uh, so, um, for in a very uh, bizarre reading of Lacan, uh, uh, Antigone is the uh, you might say, allegorization of his own tragic sense of psychoanalysis as an ethics of desire. This poses many, many problems, and um, if you want, we can discuss it. I'm not sure that I follow Lacan in that reading, which is very, very at times weird and, and, and why, and so on. But I think as to the reading of uh, Shakespeare, he shows us that there is something there. But uh, just to conclude, I would like to say that in Lacan, what you have, which is also in Freud, but not really with literature. Uh, in Freud, it is with issues of parapraxis, jokes, and uh, dreams, this attention to the Knotenpunkt in German, as you may remember. And the key term for Freud is the knots of the signifiers of language. Our language, you know, for instance, in the analysis of the rat man, what Freud manages to make of just one signifier, rat. Uh, quite amazing thing. And what in his interpretation of his own dreams, of dreams of patients, and so on. Which is something that Lacan tried to apply to literature. And really to conclude, somehow, um, in, in this book at the end, what I try to do is to use a number of texts uh, around the question of the ambassadors and uh, with I connect them with Lacan's reading of a famous painting called The Ambassadors uh, in a National Gallery in London in which we have, you may know it, a strange anamorphic skull in front of the two ambassadors as a sign of death. What interested me since this is, after all, an American text that most of you may know, was that when Henry James wrote his own novel, The Ambassadors, he was living in London, and there was a sort of interest, a new interest, in the meaning of that painting. And it is likely that it was because of that painting that James wrote this fantastic novel. If you remember, in that novel, uh, you have Strether, who is sent to France to bring back Chad, who is the son of the family, and then he falls in love with two women, of course, Chad's own lover, and also a nice French woman. And interestingly, and frustratingly, and for a French person like me, strange bizarre. He decides not to return, not, not to stay in Paris, <laughs> but to return to the US. <laughs> Why? Why does he return? <laughs> I have an answer, okay. <laughs> to die. He returned to the US to die. Surprisingly. Okay. Not to get married, because uh, by that time, as you may remember, Chad's mother is really fed up with him. Not only has he failed, it is. Uh, the time, but I mean, although he, uh, the son will, will, will come back, but uh, uh, he was supposed to marry her, this is over, and he has no money, and he's old, and he feels he has missed out on everything, and he will return to life. I, I, I have other arguments to uh, buttress that thesis that come from other texts by Henry James, but 
I was interested in this, and this is how I end with uh, the, this book. And this idea of what is it that you learn from literature, fundamentally? And what you learn, I was really sort of huge statement, but it would have to be uh, made more productive, maybe in different contexts, is a certain sense of traversing death, traversing the death trial, and getting out of it somehow, which I think is something that one can, can, can get from, let's say, important novels like The Ambassadors or plays like Hamlet, the moment that Hamlet jumps into the tomb of Ophelia and it's when it says, I, the, the, uh, Hamlet the deity, uh, retrieving his subjectivity after he has gone through sort of death. Okay? But I want to leave time for questions if there are any. Obsessed with his own work, that anybody who came 
around uh, proximity was somehow absorbed and had to work for him and so on. And so it was a very slightly disappointing human element, but at the same time, it's because Joyce was quite aware that what he was doing should be of interest for the future of humanity, let's say. And so it was a sort of task that he imagined, and for me, a key element in this is the way in which Joyce, when he was totally depressed over what happened to his daughter, thought he was going to allow a friend, James Stevens, an Irish writer, to finish Finnegan's Way. Which shows that he imagined that the text like Finnegan's Way could be done, could be finished by someone else. And so here, I, I slightly, I mean, I slightly disagree with um, on, on, on these important issues, but uh, I think she and I agree as opposed to Elizabeth Odinesco, for instance, yeah? because among the Lacanians, you have a group led by today Odinesco who think that when Lacan writes on Joyce, he is a little gaga. Okay, let me put it bluntly like that. I don't think so, for instance. I think really, and Alain Badiou, for instance, would have the same position I have, that the later Lacan, even though highly impossible to read because really he writes like every word is like puns in several languages and so on which makes it very very difficult you can say in Joyce's case if he was writing a work of art he was inventing a new language but come on with Lacan who was teaching in a seminar why have these constant puns and so on and he couldn't write or speak differently that's how where, where he was. He had entered that equivocation of language that he saw as a tool for psychoanalysis, but then it became his own symptom. But the reason why uh, Badiou and others insist that the later Lacan had uh, uh, found something really important, it is the famous theory of the saint which he could only elaborate with drugs. See? So I'm not sure what I've answered to all your questions, but uh, whether Joyce was not a likable person, we all agree we wouldn't necessarily want to meet Joyce today. But to read him, yes. Uh, and this is a point that uh, Samuel Beckett made about Dante. I don't know whether uh, you would have seen this very interesting uh, early review by uh, Beckett of a book by Papini, who was a futurist. Uh, he's forgotten to be Papini, a very important writer, was a friend of Marinetti. Papini, in 1930 or so, had written a book on Dante. Basically, in that book, he said, we need to know Dante the man, because we want to love Dante. And Beckett, not at all. We don't want to love Dante. We want to read Dante. I think it will be the same. Which was. So, question. Yes. Yeah, I wanted to uh, brought it back. Uh, that I wanted you to maybe say a few words about where psychoanalysis and literature come together for you in the work you're currently doing on, on Beckett. If you could just say a few words about that. Uh, in connection with Beckett. Yeah, with Beckett. Ah, that's as you know, Beckett had analysis with you yes. for two years. And we don't really know much about that. I wrote to my friend Simon Critchley, who teaches here at the New School. He interviewed a number of people who had been in contact with Bion and who had been at the Tavistock Clinic at the time. And uh, he, he, he tried to make them say whether Bion said anything about Beckett directly. Because we don't really know. We have no testimony. Uh, Bion. Bion was very, very young at that time when he treated Beckett. What we know is that, and it's been always repeated in every book on Beckett, there's this little story that Bion took Beckett to a lecture by Jung. Jung, you, you know this? No, maybe not. Okay. Jung was talking about a young girl who was maybe 10, who had died, after I tried to treat her. And Jung 
said, in fact, so Jung had a very long silence, meditated, and he said, in fact, she was swallowed by her unconscious, she was not properly born. Beckett ran out of the room and finished Murphy. I simplify a little bit. But <laughs> that was the key, and he stopped the analysis. So Bion had a really a very smart idea. He brought him to Jung, and Beckett didn't like Jung. Uh, in, in all the letters that have been published, you can see that Beckett much prefers Freud, and we know we now have all the notes that he took. Beckett read a lot in psychoanalysis at that time and later on. Many of his works are so close to psychoanalysis, but there is this link with Bion that is so interesting. And in the same way, I mean, repeating somehow the Lacanian story, if you know Bion's works, you know that the last uh, books he wrote are really bizarre Beckettian novels. <laughs> the huge trilogy and so on. And so, did he do it to imitate Beckett? The, it, it's, it's a little unclear. But anyway, in Beckett's own uh, links with uh, psychoanalysis, I, I, I have a, a little section on, on, on Beckett here. I'd say that Beckett is closer indeed to uh, the, the Bionian model. He was one of the, and I don't know Bion well enough, I have to say, I'm happy. Uh, but one idea that I think Beckett found in Bion, and maybe it was acted out, in the interactions was this idea of thoughts without the subject. And you find this in Beckett somehow, that there are thoughts that can be taken by certain people, but they, they happen like that. And, and also in Lyon, you have the theory of the non-knowledge, which is so important for Beckett. And in my own, I mean, in that uh, a book on uh, Beckett that will be published in, I mean, will be out in two or three months. Um, I use a lot the philosopher that Beckett, as you may know, had discovered, and basically we, only Beckett had read it, called Holanx, uh, or Golanx. The, the Flemish philosopher uh, was a Cartesian philosopher whose main motto that you, if you read, uh, Murphy and other novels by Beckett is Ubi Nihil Wales, Ibi, I'm oh, sorry, Ubi Nihil Wales, Ibi Nihil Wales. Where you are worth nothing, you will want nothing. But the complicated philosopher, Golanx, who I think one could say is the first thinker of the unconscious because he inverts Cartesian rationalism, uh, the, the main verb of uh, Golanx is nescio, I don't know, it, which is the sort of paved the way to say Schopenhauer, Hegel even, and so on, philosophers of the 19th century. And we know that Beckett really read systematically not only the literature of psychoanalysis, he took notes on Jones and Stecker and Freud and so on, but also read philosophy with that angle somehow. Uh, because for Beckett, the question was what happens if you get swallowed in your unconscious? Uh, those of you who may have read Murphy, uh, in Murphy, the hero uh, dies in a hospital, mental hospital, uh, after having realized that the friendship he thought he had established with a psychotic Mr. Enden was not a friendship because precisely because the psychotic is a psychotic, he never recognized Murphy as another subject. And he dies. So that was a really, really important question for, for Beckett. At the same time, and something that not so many people know, <coughs> we know that Beck, I mean, I, uh, Beckett remained in touch with Lucia Joyce all her life and would visit her very, very often. She's interesting. Felt perhaps a little guilty for what had happened to Lucia Joyce. This is another complicated history somehow, but as you may know, in the Joyce family, uh, and this is what I was saying with Joyce, you know, Joyce saw this nice, handsome, smart, 
Irish young man who happened on the scene in Paris in 1928, who obviously loved Joyce's work, but Joyce thought immediately, he will marry my daughter. And Beckett was not interested in the daughter, but in the father. Oh. <laughs> 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 yes. yes. I'd like to offer a different kind of explanation of the psychoanalytic interpretation of literature based on the theory of Harry Moore. Um, since you mentioned Hamlet, if I may take a few minutes, I would like to discuss Hamlet in light of more nice theory, which has nothing to do with drives, Oedipus complex, or anything like that. Primarily, I would like to focus on this famous soliloquy. I only recite a few lines, not the whole thing. I don't know the whole thing. Um, to be or not to be, that is the question. With this is no good in the mind to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, or to take arms against the sea of trouble, and by opposing the end them. So he has two possible solutions. To take arms against the sea of troubles, which in Hornice terms is the expansive solution, the solution of mastery, or he gives himself another choice, resignation to suffer the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune. And then Shakespeare puts in, "'Tis nobler in the mind." Why does he say in the mind? Because according to Harnai's theory, to the extent that we're neurotic, we live in our imagination. Not in the real world, but in our imagination. And I'd like to go later on into the speech. Um, and thus, conscience does make cowards of us all. And thus, the native your resolution is sickly oared by the pale cast of thought. And in this regard, enterprises of great moment and fifth and moment, their tur currents turn awry and lose the name of action. Why did Shakespeare say thought? Where did that come from? Because it's thinking too much that prevents him from acting. Hamlet idealizes his mind, his freedom. That's the resigned solution, according to, uh, to Horner. He's above the fray. He doesn't want to take action. A crisis is, is uh, precipitated in by the ghost. The ghost wants him to act. He doesn't want to act. He can't act. And so he has tremendous self-hatred. There are two other soliloquies in the play in which he uh, elaborates on his self-hatred and his contempt for himself for not being able to act. So his self-image is shattered by the ghost. The bedroom scene, I think, has nothing to do with such an at all. And with love his father, he has contempt for his mother for having abandoned the father and married. Um, Did you have a particular question that you wanted to yeah. ask? Excuse me. Is there a particular question that you wanted to address? I just wanted to give a different kind of interpretation of psychoanalysis and literature. Yeah, that's, thank you. There are many, many interpretations of, of Hamlet, and many are, um, do not necessarily use the theory of the drive. What I would like simply to, to say in, I think, what, what makes Hamlet such an important play is that there is obviously something that doesn't work in the thoughts. Yeah. Uh, and if we take Hamlet as a text, let's say, not just the character, which, you know, the danger is, of course, to analyze literary characters as if they were our neighbors. The main difference is that they are beams of ink and paper, and maybe they can be enacted by actors and directors who give them new life and a body. But fundamentally, if we talk, we talk of literature, it should be literature. So within literature, there is something 
that is beyond thought. This is why I don't think I would agree with your stress on thinking of, of this is why we were talking about beyond. Uh, if there is something like the unconscious, uh, you have already in psychoanalysis this huge paradox. You know, French philosopher Sartre rejected the idea of the unconscious. You cannot have the unconscious because either you're conscious or you're not conscious. This is what you have with Hamlet. But we have to go beyond that. And we have to make sense of the whole text. And for instance, things like, how does the murdered king know who killed him? The simple question. He was asleep. Somebody poured poison in his ear. He seems nevertheless to know that it is his brother. For some readers, at least Renaissance readers, this meant that he had this not acquired this knowledge maybe in hell. And therefore he's a bad ghost. And therefore cannot be trusted. And of course you have the question of Ophelia. Is she just a later addition, a subplot, or is she central to the text? But I want to insist on this. I think that what literary criticism brings to psychoanalysis and what psychoanalysis brings to literary criticism is this notion that the unconscious is like a text and the text is like an unconscious. But it means that you don't want to psychologize these because then you fall into in terms of literary criticism, but me and my colleagues, we don't like when people say, is so-and-so a good character or a bad character? You know, that's not the point. The point is, how is this a text? And so here, I think the text means that something is unthought in the words. You know, this is something that has interested me a lot. Psychoanalysis is accepted in film studies, in uh, contemporary, let's say, gender studies, in uh, art criticism, mm -hmm. in popular culture, not really in English departments. And my Shakespearean colleagues hate Freud. Okay, <laughs> for instance, and, and that's so many, uh, what a brilliant Shakespearean friend who just retired, Margreta de Grazia, wrote a whole book on Shakespeare. Every time I try to mention Freud, no, or even Lacan, no. Um, why is that? Uh, I think it is a moment, and it is a reaction still, to the delirium of bad interpretations of the 50s and 60s. Um, you had two schools at that time, the religious school, and you know, everything was Christ somehow, or Mary, or an apostle, and so on, and the Freudians, and they were all terribly bad, mm -hmm. really. <laughs> and so uh, we might now come back to a more subtle understanding of these issues. But it is true that for the moment, and maybe because of the new historicism and the fact that somehow uh, these days there's a lot of what's called material culture or archival work and so on. But it doesn't mean that it is not informed by psychoanalysis, but not directly like that. Um. As I recall, uh, Joyce had a goal among many goals to change consciousness of the human being. Exactly, yeah, yeah. And yeah. so is there, in your opinion, a connection between that attempt, that effort, that goal, and any um, worthwhile analytical goal? Creative, other creative goals? Yes, thank you. That's a wonderful question. Okay, yeah. Is, is, is there a link between what Joyce 
was positing as his goal to change, he, he says, the conscience of, of my race, which is a little loaded, but meaning at least of Ireland, and it is, and maybe of, say, the culture of the Western world, just to be modest. <laughs> um, yes, I think it is. I mean, some of you may have seen this recent book, a book I like, and I defend it against my friends who are joy specialists, Kevin Birmingham, The Most Dangerous Book. Uh, I recommend this book. It's really a book on Ulysses that you can read without having read Ulysses. It will, want to, it will make you want to read Ulysses, but what it shows very well is the censorship in England and in the US at the time of Ulysses. And the fact simply that Ulysses is still today considered one of the most important novels of the 20th century has achieved such a revolution in the consciousness that it is quite obvious. And one very subtle thing that that means so my my colleagues, the Joy Scholars, don't like it because he has a long section on Joyce and Syphilis, and he tries to prove that Joyce had Syphilis, whether it's true or not. Not very important, but OK. I think he, he may have a point, but it, it, and, and then that some other Joyceans had already said that before, and so on. But he, he makes a point that is very Freudian, even though I don't think he's Freudian at all, or Lacanian for that matter. He's a very good historian of literature from Harvard, and so on. But this book reads like a novel, really is extremely gripping. What it shows is this. As you may know, in Joyce's life, and this is the Freudian moment, in Joyce's life, in 1909, he went to Dublin to launch, to open the first cinema, the first theater in Dublin, the Volta. During that time, he was on his own in Dublin, and he met a few former friends, from the past, uh, just a few years after he left, who all told him that they had slept with Nora. And he became completely, you might say, almost quasi psychotic and panicked, sent her all those letters, and then was convinced by her. And then it became the most extraordinarily erotic correspondence that you can find. Okay. I don't know whether you read the letters of Joyce to Nora from 1909, they're extraordinary. For a long time, this is a complicated story, <laughs> Joyce's grandson, who is still alive in Paris and kicking, uh, prevented any publication, quotation, allusion to the letters. Uh, they go very far. You have Joyce who said that he wants to see Nora defecate on his face, and think very, very, very erratic, almost gross, but <laughs> uh, they, they correspond to a subjective, how should I say, a crossing of boundaries. Kevin Birmingham made the point that when Joyce writes Ulysses, he treats his readers like Nora. <laughs> See what I mean? So what shocked, for instance, the first friends, even Ezra Pound, when Ezra Pound got in the installments for the little review <coughs> and for the egoist of the fourth chapter of Ulysses, what shot Pound was the fact that you see at the end of this chapter, if you read it, Broom goes to stool, and for two or three pages, you have a, an evocation of what it feels like to be shitting, let's put it bluntly. <laughs> and that was unacceptable then. Even Pound, who was quite an avant-gardist, uh, said, no, no, my dear Jim, you cannot, we have to cut this and Joyce, but uh, no, 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 I want it, and so on. And so this has changed something, and I think it is comparable to what Freud has brought, you know, about the sexual education of children and all those things that we forget, that it is thanks to Freud that, uh, you know, we don't, uh, as Beckett says, uh, you are told so often, that you were born under the cabbage patch, that you go back to your garden and you recognize the place where you were born. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the, at, at that level, there is indeed a sort of structural homology 
in culture, and uh, we could take film as well. But, you know, what was happening then in psychoanalysis via Freud, and the Freudians and Joyce in, in literature, and that has changed indeed something. Uh, I, I need to interrupt. Uh, Jean-Michel was telling us over dinner that in France, people are trained to give yes. seminars, but seminars are three or four hours. <laughs> I've been standing here trying to indicate we're at the end of this one. <laughs> we have that time frame for the end. Thank you very much. Thank you.